post-war America. And on the West Coast, California. Wherever things worth doing, it's worth doing to excess. The number of young studs competing in the Traffic Light Grand Prix swelled to such an extent that it started to get organized. It became apparent that the game had to be taken off the streets and out onto purpose-built racetracks. The modern-day drag strips were born. Drag race cars look the way they do basically because they have to. Street rods look much the same as drag racers because their owners want them to look that way. And that's because they both share the same parentage and a common background. Away from the strip, the builders of these early street-driven hot rods worked with graceful full-fendered cars like Ford's Model T, Model A and the Model B. They refined their hobby to such a degree that it became a sport. The sport became a science and the cars became an art form. Using for material the plentiful supply of pre-war cars rotting in every scrapyard across America, the hot rodder's first task was to junk everything which wasn't vital to the cause of higher speed. During this process, fenders, windscreens and large chunks of bodywork were simply thrown away. Only after that were the performance parts added to the engine, the suspension and so on. They were creating by accident the now traditional style of the hot rod. Huge rear tyres, small spindly front wheels and a monster engine. Because those early racers used their cars on the strip at weekends and on the road the rest of the time, their appearance was eventually copied for its own sake. Hence the street rod, a car which looks like a race car, but it isn't. In fact, the street rod is usually a whole lot prettier. It's frighteningly expensive and may well have taken two or three years to build. Nobody still in possession of all their marbles would take anything that unique anywhere near something as dangerous as motor racing. But all this evolutionary number was happening back in the late 40s and early 50s. And an awful lot has happened since then, even in rodding. As well as developing into new styles like the low rider or the street custom, rodding also crossed the Atlantic in the early 70s. And now you can find it parked on the corner of the street where you live. Rodding has certainly found its way down the street where professional car builder Ray Christopher lives. Ray's been building street rods and things for a number of years now. He's produced some real show-stopping vehicles. This is the vehicle that's given me most pleasure in building. It's a 1908 Model T. To produce a vehicle of this stature and this age, you have to go to a reference library to find out the particular sizes that the car will be built in. Uh, it takes approximately three months to get all the information together to produce a sort of vehicle like this. We would spend another two to three months on the drawing board getting the whole business together just to get the car to look right or authentic. On other cars that we've built, obviously we don't have to go back to this sort of information. But on this one, basically I wanted the car to be produced that it looked just like the original 1908 Model T. So, on to the other parts of the car. Firstly, we'll start with the chassis. This is of three by inch box steel construction. And then we go on to the solid drawn tube on the bottom. This makes the whole front suspension very, very stiff. Now, the type of suspension we've put on this car is the wishbone uh, with coilover shock, giving us a total independent suspension. We need this because we want to run on modern roads. Obviously, the original car didn't have this type of suspension on it, and it couldn't run on our type of roads now. It would give major problems. Next, we have the brass. This, obviously, you cannot purchase now. Like all custom car stuff, you have to, or the owner has to make it himself. Now this is made from 18 gauge brass. The lights are spun and this is all handmade. The only thing that isn't handmade is the motor meter on the top. Wheels and tires. These are an essential part of the custom car. Normally the wheels would be of mag alley construction or chromed. 
The body on this vehicle is hand formed from sheet steel. This is where your detail to drawing comes in. We have to, all of us customizers, get our cars looking as near to the original as we possibly can. This is a 2000 Pinto motor. It's four cylinders. I would have preferred to put in a V8 motor, but being restricted for room, we just could not get a V8 engine in it. Now normally the customizer would love to use a V8 engine, and normally does. This gives the car an aesthetic value uh, and really sets the car off apart from others. On this point, if you can imagine this car going down the motorway and really passing every other thing, it gives a lot of people a lot of shock just to see a car looking this old running this fast. Upholstery. Now this is really down to the individual's taste. It can be done in leather cloth, draylons, velvets, it can be stitched, upholstered, but basically this one is down to buttoned and tucked leather cloth. Well, Pete, I feel we're going to have to put a gusset in this piece. Once you have the working drawings, you've got to get out in the workshop and nail it all together. How long have we been doing this darn thing, mate? Uh, January, I think we started. January? Gosh, it's like an eternity. But you feel the gusset should be OK? Yeah, I'll Agreed? Be, yeah, go ahead. Uh, mind your eyes, then. Well, it's at this point that everyone who wants to build a car from scratch, restore an old one, or substantially alter the appearance of a modern one has to come to a screeching halt and think. The only way to do it is to learn some, if not all, of the crafts of those original tradesmen who built cars by hand half a century ago. So, it's out with the Teach Yourself books, off to night school, and round to your mate's house to learn woodwork, machining, upholstery, and welding, before you ever begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Not everybody has a professionally equipped workshop like this. Not everybody has the money to pay a professional to do the difficult bits. And not everybody who has to work in a cold and lonely garage late at night gets it right first time. The enthusiast needs endless patience, working on a lump of metal that only gradually begins to look like a car. Well, Pete, if we pawn this in, get this edge looking nice, the, the bonnet line comes up through there and um, we'll have to get this really look in the business so it looks really nice. And fill up here. Um, what do you feel about that? How much do you think we want on? Well, a few thou. Well, really, yeah. All right, I'll let yeah. you get on with so it. I'll finish this bit off and then we'll uh, carry on with that other job later yeah. on. Okay. Probably the least glamorous and most arduous task of all is preparing the car body for painting. It's a continual repetition of filling and sanding off, then filling again and finishing until the body's completely smooth. It's a process which is a great deal harder, a great deal longer, and far more dispiriting than anyone who hasn't done it can believe. When you think it's finished, it probably isn't. Now, it could look okay from a distance, but there are usually thousands of small imperfections which have to be removed if you don't want to ruin the finished paintwork. Just to make it just on the edge and then we'll clean them up later on. Okay. Finally, you apply a mixture of paint types and colours, smooth the whole thing down between coats, not forgetting, of course, those numerous coats of clear lacquer. If you still haven't had enough, there's plenty of scope for the artist in you to come to the surface. And finally, this is where it all pays off. The hours, weeks, even years of painstaking labour just to get your car out on the road. That's what it's really all about. Rather than just tamely walking into a dealer's showroom, you invest time and effort in return for a car that not even the Joneses can keep up with.
these cruising freaks. They go out together. They meet in clubs, pubs and motel car parks, chatting over the details of their cars, swapping rather tall stories about the work involved and poring curiously over each newcomer. How long did it take you to do the car? Uh, about a year of evenings, weekends, a lot of hard work. Uh, it's been tried to make it look like a standard American car. It's really yeah. good. It really looks the business nice. Take, should take that up. I like this pool. How long did it take you to do this one? Well, we were on holiday for two weeks and uh, his mate Gary here decided we'd sort of change it for a little, sort of make it look a bit meaner on the road. And, yeah, it's the same as, same as my car, that was using badge impression. It's very well, good. Well, they're the yeah. best, aren't they? Yeah, they are, yeah. Well, basically it's a XJ6 and I've altered all the bodywork on it. Basically the roof and um, around the boot area is uh, most of it. So I've sectioned the roof, moved it forward, put a bigger boot lid on it. You've done a lot inside too? You've that's changed right. the seats? That's right. The wife's done most of that. As I say, we uh, don't believe in spending too much money elsewhere, so we do it all ourselves. The body's a copy of a Model T Ford. Um, and the style of the car is um, based on a 1940s style American dirt track racer. And uh, it's also got a flip body. A flip body? Yeah. Well, this is worth a look. Yeah. What's the engine, John? That's out of a Rover 3.5. Right. Around about 1972. That's Plymouth body, yeah. Yeah. Austin Steel, Westminster. all glass fibre. Fibreglass. Yeah. And what's the running gear on it now? Um, Austin Westminster, the axles and the engine. Yeah. Is it running nicely? Yeah, it runs like a dream.